It's good to see you this morning. I was thinking as I was, we were setting up this morning that as we gather in the darkness, so we will leave in the light. And I think that's a good metaphor for what happens at His Way each and every day. Um, a lot of brothers come um, darkened in their understanding and they leave in the light. And so I'm so thankful um, for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful resurrection day. Father, in the world that can be filled with darkness and pain, suffering and turmoil, Father, we're thankful that you sent your son into this world to suffer the same struggles that we all feel and to suffer them beyond. And that he was willing to go to that cross that we would be liberated from the bondage of this world and ultimately set free on this glorious resurrection morning. Father, we pray that you will help us to honor you by celebrating um, the life that you have given us in Christ and the great um, community that you have created in love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, I've asked um, our speaker today to come share. This is kind of a... The, definitely the more challenging of our um, sharing times here, but um, Michelle Pardue, who's the mother of Ryan Pardue, who graduated here uh, back in August 4th of 2019, and unfortunately passed away November 24th of 2019. Um, I've asked her to come share her journey and, uh, and encourage us um, with words as she um, walks out the journey of faith um, with that um, situation. So, Michelle, if you'd like to come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. So Tom called me, um, I guess about 10 days ago, and said that one of the things that they do at this sunrise service is that uh, they invite loved ones who have lost someone to addiction to come to the service and he asked me if I could speak about my journey and what it's been like um, and maybe just offer some hope and some understanding to those people who are new to the journey or who may not be as far along on that journey as I am. Uh, as Tom said, I lost my son four and a half years ago. He had just turned 21. He actually turned 21 the day that he graduated. Uh, and I remember that everyone at the graduation sang happy birthday to him and it made him cry. Um, and it made me cry because there, there were times that I thought he would never live to see 21. And, you know, at that graduation, I really felt that for the first time that I had great hope that Ryan was going to be okay. Um, I can tell you that <clears throat> in my personal experience after four and a half years, it hasn't gotten easier, but it has gotten more bearable, if that makes sense. I was chatting with a, a, another mother here earlier this morning who also lost her son. And we kind of call, you know, I call it the invisible chains. It's like you, you have this grief and it's always with you, but after you carry it for so long, you get better at carrying it. And, um, you know, my son Ryan was a very kind, very funny, very gentle, sweet young man. He was six foot eight, so he was a big guy. They used to call him the gentle giant. Um, but he suffered from depression and um, he started self-medicating at 14 years of age and by the time he was 18 he was a full-blown addict. An addiction was a demon that grabbed him by the throat. Um, my, my sweet, happy, uh, gentle, carefree son became hostile, moody, difficult. He eventually became a liar and a thief because that's what addiction does. It takes over your whole life. It, it grabs onto you and 
uh, Ryan went to five separate rehabs and for years so you know I'm talking to the parents right now the parents and the people that are here who have lost a child um, because I know you can understand this you know for years I begged God to heal him I covered him with prayer morning noon and night um, I just did everything I could possibly do to help Ryan get this demon off his back. We spent a lot of money. We spent a lot of time. We spent a lot of nights praying, crying, begging, pleading with God. You know, he, he suffered like all addicts. He suffered terribly. His addiction brought him so much emotional and physical pain and it brought it to the whole family. And Ryan himself lived with self-loathing and shame. Oops. as most addicts do. Oh, thank you. Um, and again, I continue to pray. I even remember asking God, you know, like, why don't you give me an affliction? This is the bargaining stage that we go through. Like, if you can heal Ryan, you can take me. You know, whatever it needs to be done to set him free, you know, give it to me. Um, when Ryan finally came to his way, I felt such great hope because it is such an amazing program. And Ryan did too, and he was so proud of himself. And he was clean for 10 and a half months. Um, he relapsed three months after graduating, and he died four weeks after his relapse. And I felt so betrayed by God, as everyone who ha is here because they have lost a loved one, I know you know what that feels like. Um, doesn't it hurt to beg God so much for your loved one's healing and to feel like he's not listening? Um, and, and so after the shock wore off that Ryan had passed away, which I mean, really it was about six months after he died before it really fully hit me that, you know, I was not gonna see him on this earth again. Um, then what happened to me was the what ifs. And if you're here because you have lost someone, I know that you know what the what ifs are all about. It's a, it's a bad game that you play with yourself. Um, you know, whenever I see a young father with a child, I think, what if, what if Ryan hadn't taken that pill that night that was loaded with fentanyl? What if, we had recognized that he had relapsed. What if, would he be graduating from college? Would he be in love with a wonderful woman? Would he be getting ready to get married and start a family? Especially when I see his classmates and people his age, you know, it often, the what ifs. And then there's also the what ifs when I'm driving to work in the morning and I see people living under a bridge. What if Ryan did live and he spent his whole life struggling with addiction? What if he was homeless? What if he was hurting? What if he was in prison? What if, what if, what if, what if? And so it really took me probably about three years before I realized that trying to figure out God's plan and beating myself up with the what ifs is, is just a, a waste of time. Because honestly, I, I am comforted by the fact that knowing that Ryan, there are no what ifs about heaven. There are no what ifs. Just like Jesus died and was resurrected when Ryan and all of the people whose names will be read today, when they died, they were given new life. And in heaven, there are no what ifs. There's no shame, there's no pain, there's no failure. What if I choose to know that God's plan is better than any of my you know, my thoughts, my constant 
scenario changing, my, my trying to understand what if I choose to believe that God's plan for Ryan happened the way that it was supposed to. I know for certain that Ryan is in a beautiful place. I know for certain that he feels love and joy. And so trusting in God's plan is the what if that I choose. It's how I survive. I know that my son is finally healed and I know that all of your loved ones are healed. They are in heaven and they are living a new life with Christ. God bless all of you on this Easter Sunday. For those of you that have lost someone to addiction, don't let the what ifs ruin your life. Don't let it rob you of the comfort and joy of knowing that your loved one is with God and is with Jesus. And don't let it, don't let it ruin the rest of your life trying to figure it out or trying to guess. Just rest in the beauty of God's plan. And I know it's really hard, but there is so much peace when you finally get to that place. Thank you. In a moment, we'll have an introduction to reading the names of the residents who passed. But before we do, I'd like to just share some uh, thoughts with you. Uh, I'd like to read a poem that's written by Nicholas Evans. It's, ca uh, uh, it's called, If I Be the First of Us to Die. If I be the first of us to die, let grief not blacken long your sky. Be bold yet modest in your grieving, there is a change, but not a leaving. For just as death is part of life, the dead live on forever in the living. And all the gathered riches of our journey, the moments shared, the mysteries explored, the steady layering of intimacy stored, the things that made us laugh or weep or sing, the joy of sunlit snow or first unfurling of the spring. The wordless language of look and touch, the knowing, each giving and taking. These are not flowers that fade, nor trees that fall and crumble, nor are they stone. For even stone cannot the wind and rain withstand, even mighty mountain peaks in time reduced to sand. What we were, we are. What we had, we have. A conjoined past, imperishably present. So when you walk the wood where we once walked together, and scan in vain the dappled bank beside you for my shadow, or pause where we always did upon the hill to graze across the land, to gaze across the land, and spotting something reached by habit for my hand, and finding none, feel sorrow start to steal upon you. Be still, close your eyes, breathe. Listen for my footfall in your heart. I am not gone, but merely walk within you. Why is it important today to honor those loved ones who have, who have passed? It's because in honoring their memory, we proudly declare that their life had value, worth, and meaning. They matter. And what you're doing today is the start or maybe the continuation of a new chapter. It does not have to be a chapter where your loved one is forgotten, but is instead kept alive and celebrated in your memories, traditions, and in your lives. Who you are today has been shaped in some part by your love for them and their love for you. That will never change, but it can grow into something different and meaningful by choosing to honor their lives even while keenly feeling their absence. Find ways to keep their memories alive and honor your love for them. Fix their favorite food. Watch their favorite TV shows or movies. Listen to the music they loved. Do something they loved to do. Do something they always wanted to do, but were not able to. Remember them during holidays or birthdays. Continue to celebrate who they were and what they mean to you. Honoring our loved ones who have passed, while at times a sad and difficult journey, allows us to move forward with them. To move forward with the memory of who they were and how much we love and miss them. And even though they are not physically present, our love for them burns like a blazing fire in our hearts. 
This is not an ending. This is the beginning of something new. And it starts or is continuing today with honoring them. In a moment, we'll be reading the names. Barry and Vicki Johnson will be reading the names of uh, the loved ones who have passed this year or this past year. And when you hear their name, please stand up and remain standing. And after the reading, we'll give each family a lily and then Barry will lead us in a prayer to close, uh, to close out that part of reading, uh, of recognizing those who have passed. So um, Barry and Vicki, if you'll come on up. Michael Black, April 13th, 2023. Rex Rankin, July 3, 2023. Charles Treckler, July 13th, 2023. Kevin Grooms, August 4, 2023. James Judd Jr., JR, October 26, 2023. Alan Quinn, November 10, 2023. Tyler Harbin, December 29th, 2023. Cole Eddy, January 26th, 2024. And Robin Wadley, March the 7th, 2024. Holy Father, Sovereign God, this morning we honor these families and recognize the pain that comes with losing a loved one. Grant these families peace in their grief. Remove any guilt they have. The why didn't I's the only ifs that they rehearse every day. Give them the peace that passes all understanding that only you can provide. In the name of our, in the name of your son, our risen savior, amen. amen. So we come now uh, to uh, the communion service and want to spend a few minutes uh, thinking about that. <laughs> So, um, I'll have to say, I uh, shamelessly have borrowed from someone else. <laughs> You've probably done that too. Uh, but now there was there's someone that I really had learned a lot about communion that I've been studying lately, and um, I found it very helpful to my understanding. Uh, it's John Mark Hicks, who's a professor of theology at Lipscomb University, and uh, he's written a book about it, and he's preached on it extensively. Uh, it's been very helpful for me my understanding of the communion service. So beginning that, I wanted to uh, look a minute at um, uh, 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 10. And in this uh, chapter, uh, we find there's a lot of discussion about Israel. And of course, obviously, as, uh, in the Christian faith, we look to Israel to get a lot of our information about uh, God. And in this, he's, Paul says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we are all partakers of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Now that, a lot of times I've read over that many times, I'm sure many of you have, and um, I don't think I really fully understood it. Um, and why do we consider Israel? Again, as we said, obviously it's Israel's where Christ comes from uh, in the lineage, but there's more to it. And one of the things that uh, was brought out to me in studying through what he had presented is looking back then, what is it about Israel? Um, Israel, we think a lot of times about all these different rituals and uh, these different uh, meeting, uh, coming together. And, and when we pass over that, a lot of times we think of the Passover, all these other different ones. But um, one of the, the things they have is... Um, these different types of offerings, sacrifices. Um, and of course, the communion is about a sacrifice. 
uh, and when we think about Christ's sacrifice. But um, there's all kinds of different sacrifices, and there's those that are burnt offerings where it's completely destroyed, you burn it up, but then there are the fellowship offerings, uh, or thanks offerings, and that's where everybody comes together for a meal, and they actually eat the sacrifice. Um, and so it's not destroyed uh, and all the families come together and they share in that sacrifice and actually eat it. Um, uh, eating is a ritual, it's an important ritual, it's a, a life-sustaining ritual. Rituals are good for us. Sometimes we think, well, rituals, that's boring and it doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's just something we do r without thinking. But, uh, you know, rituals bring order out of chaos. It, it helps us to have some structure to our lives. That's what we need a lot of times to reorder ourselves by having these different times where we come together um, and, and get that ritual with family or friends. Uh, rituals uh, like the eating is done uh, with a lot of times with Thanksgiving and joy and, and coming together. Uh, a lot of times it's done in businesses, uh, sealing a deal or uh, a contract. Uh, of sharing in a meal. Um, it's many times, we, we, doctors don't like lawyers, but there's many times we have to deal with lawyers and a lot of times after something that we've done and worked with a lawyer, we, we go somewhere and have a meal together. Uh, and so that these are, these are uh, done often. So um, in Exodus 24, there's a, a passage that's really, uh, that came to light through this study that struck me very uh, much is that it talks about there that they have this uh, fellowship offering. They've gone to Mount Sinai uh, and they offer up this sacrifice. And then the, um, they made this covenant with God and they said, yes, we're going to follow God and then um, we're going to do what you say. And then they're going to have this meal. And it says that uh, Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders went up on the mountain of God. And it says that they they ate in the pre and drank in the presence of God, and they saw God at that time. And they described what they saw. They said it was this amazing sight. It looked like a sapphire, a blue, like the sky, and God was there. And they ate and drank in the presence of God. And so they had this meal together, and God came down, and they were able to see God, and they did not die, it says. And so we find that the same thing happens uh, as we come into the New Testament that you know Christ has come down is <laughs> God with us and here we find that on um, there's a just amazing things that happen if we can come to that understanding that that Christ is there in this meal that we share on the communion service and you know of course it, Tom's going to talk about I guess that you know that, that sometimes about Friday and the Sunday's coming or whatever that we 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 we've heard this and we again it kind of becomes a ritual to us that we don't think about but it's in the sharing of the meal like on the road to Emmaus that these two disciples were walking they're sad they're living in Friday and yet all of a sudden Jesus is walking with them and explaining scriptures they don't recognize him but then they say, well, don't go on, he's going to leave, but it's a coming with us. And so they share a meal, and yet Jesus does just as he did before the, the crucifixion. He actually becomes the host. He's in their house, but he's now the host. He says he took the bread, and he broke it, and prayed, and thanked, and gave it to them. And it's in that meal that they said they recognized that that was actually Jesus. And so in this meal, if we can come to understand what's going on there, we find that Jesus is actually the one that's the host. He's the one that's giving us this meal. Uh, and he's sitting at the table. And so a lot of times we do take communion as though it's Friday and we're very sad. We think about what well, Christ had to suffer because I'm such an idiot and, and I've sinned and made a mess of my life and everybody around me. And, um, and I put him on that cross. But yet, just like with Israel, it wasn't really just about a time of sadness. In Deuteronomy 27, again thinking about the fellowship offering, it says there that you eat the fellowship offering and you rejoiced before the Lord. And so it's actually a time of rejoicing, not a time of sadness. 
uh, Jesus said to remember me, but it's in that remembrance that we're actually thankful and we're, you know, we're actually full of joy because of what he did for us. And so it's not to be that we're just living in Friday, we're, we're in the joy of, of Sunday of the risen host who is Christ our Lord. In Revelation 1.10 it says that on the day of the Lord, that's when John is writing the book of Revelation, that Jesus appeared and he said that, you know, I'm alive forevermore and, um, you know, that he's no longer dead and he has done this wonderful thing for us uh, on the cross, but it's not just a time of sadness, it's a time of great thanksgiving and joy uh, that he has done this. Now, I was, as, as a physician, uh, I mean, I, everybody is afraid of death. We, like, like it says in Hebrews that, you know, everybody is sort of in slavery because of death. We fear that we're going to die. Uh, we saw that tremendously during COVID. Everybody's afraid. Uh, fear is everywhere. The fear of death is, is prevalent. Uh, but Jesus has said, you know, we don't have to live in that kind of fear anymore because of what he has done. And so we can give great thanks for this great sacrifice and be glad. So I'm gonna close with, uh, in Psalms 116, um, that is a, a psalm of rejoicing. It says, I love the Lord for he heard my voice, he heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me, the anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord, O oh Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O oh my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, O oh Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. So as we take this communion, let's think of that great joy that we have uh, because of what Christ has done. Let us pray as we think about the bread. And Father, we thank you for this time of remembrance. And we remember how indeed Christ had suffered and how he told us that he was the bread of life and that through his sacrifice we've been given great life and that we can enjoy being in your presence and know that you love us and that you provide for us and you care for us. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to pray, but don't drink it just after the prayer. I want to do one other thing. Let's pray. And Father, we also come before you thanking you now for this cup, the fruit of the vine, and we drink it with rejoicing, thinking of the precious blood of Christ that washes over us and takes away our sin, and our shame, and our guilt, and that we can actually come in your presence and recognize that we are the children of the living God, and that you actually, the creator of the universe, will listen to us and hear what was on our hearts and that we will in turn listen to you. Help us to submit our will to your perfect will in all things. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Lift the cup of rejoicing before the Lord as they did in Israel. They said, lift the cup with rejoicing. Let's drink. We live in a broken world a pain-filled world, a world of collapsed bridges, political turmoil, economic uncertainty, Russian-Ukrainian wars, Israeli and Hamas conflicts, Haitian unrest, immigration issues, woke ideologies, violence, gender confusion, racial tension, teen despair and suicide, sex trafficking, drug epidemic, broken homes, broken families, abuse, broken lives. A world much like the one that the apostles lived in. They, disillusioned with the world, had joined the messianic Jesus revolution, anticipating the real hope, the restoring of Israel. To see the blind, see 
the deaf hear, the paralyzed walk, the lepers restored, 5,000 fed, challenging the status quo and corruption and preaching hope. However, on Friday, their dreams were arrested, their hopes were beaten, their visions were crucified. Peter pulled out a sword that Jesus had him put back. You live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. So even the apostles' plans for loyalty, faithfulness, and devotion were sheathed. In Luke 24, it says, But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. Very early on a Sunday morning just like this, they went to continue to honor the death of their aspirations. But they found that the stone had rolled from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Their first impression was to add insult to injury. The grave is opened. The body of that one that they respected and revered so much was gone. And they didn't know who had taken him. Now they can't even pay their last respects to their dashed dreams. While they're perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed down to, their, to the ground, and the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? The question is raised, Why do you seek the living among the dead? And I'm sure that those who were originally there asked the question, What? What are you talking about? And then he goes on and says, he is not here, but he has risen. So likewise, I ask us the same question. Why are we looking for life in death? Why are we looking in Friday's solutions for Friday's problems? Why do we look to elections? or changing of policies, or another raise, or a vacation, or a new job, a new house, new clothes, new jewelry, a new television, new cars, new school, new career, new churches, new gadgets, new neighborhoods, new relationship, a new guy, a new girl, a weekend, a retirement. The answer is always the same. It is not here. The answer is in he has risen. Yes. What transformed the apostles from faithless, denying, betraying, abandoning, hiding, hiding, fear-filled cowards was the empty tomb. And my encouragement to us this morning is that we need to become Sunday people in our Friday world. Yeah. Yeah. We can't expect the world to become a Sunday world. We'll always be in Friday. But we must face Friday's problems with Sunday's solutions. We must face Friday's disappointments with Sunday's faith. We must face Friday's pain with Sunday's hope. We must meet Friday problems with a Sunday attitude. So in a practical way, I would suggest this. Love Monday. <laughs> Love weekday mornings as much as you like weekday evenings. Love the heat and humidity in the summer. Love the cold dark of winter. Thank and bless your dentist. <laughs> Brighten the day of your probation officer. Have assurance in the times of political uncertainty. Confidence in your health crisis. Joy in the face of suffering. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians, as he talks about comfort, he says in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 8, for we, do no, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he, will and he will deliver us. On him we've set our hope that he will deliver us again. 
Make no mistake about it. God does not want us to learn to rely upon ourselves because we are of the most unreliable. But he calls us to trust in him who even raises the dead. In 2 Corinthians 4, So we do not lose heart, Though our outer body is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Do you want to transform world? Then engage every crucifixion with the confidence of resurrection. Then confront every Friday frustration with Sunday gratitude. Let us be Sunday people in a Friday world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the rising of the morning sun that reminds us each and every day of the rising of your eternal son. Father, help us to constantly live as Sunday people in this Friday world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We have a couple who were baptized over this year. Um, Walker B. is a graduate of our program back on, G on February 4th of this year. And they, he and Jesse got married um, last July, and so I asked them to come and share for just a moment about how the resurrection of Jesus Christ has impacted their relationship. So, Walker, Jesse, come on up. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just to kind of touch on my baptism and what it really did for me, I'd like to start off by thanking that man back there, Jeffrey Campbell, the man that dunked me in the water. Thank you. <laughs> Best day of my life. Uh, and with that, it came a renewing of my heart and my mind. Uh, and it changed a lot of things in my life and how I was with my wife and my children. Uh, her and I were in a more of a just existing ordeal. Uh, and then we both got, when we both got baptized, it just really changed the whole dynamic of everything. Um, it's made it more enjoyable. We're not as miserable. We're not just here and there, in and out the door. Um, and it's just made everything a lot better. You know, I feel like I'm a better father, better husband. Uh, and it really just makes life that much easier to just let him have it, let him handle it, and make him the center of my marriage and me being a father to my children. So, it's your turn. <laughs> I'm not a great speaker, so excuse me. Um, I agree with what Walker said before, you know, when we were in our relationship, before we got married. And before he came here, we were just existing. And I also felt like a part of me was just missing. And I longed for that peace with God and that relationship with God. And, you know, he, whenever he got here and he got baptized, we started talking about things. And I was able to talk with Selwyn before, you know, I got baptized. And ever since then, I feel like our relationship is more meaningful and God-centered and we do I feel like it has made us better as a couple and watching him on this journey and being a better father and it's also made me a better person and more patient and kind and I just feel like making that decision has really saved my life in more ways than one so yeah We're talking about uh, the newly baptized, and uh, we want to honor all those who have uh, been baptized this uh, past year uh, in his way family. And uh, we're going to read the names of those who've been resurrected from death and translated into life uh, this past year. And uh, so we're going to read the names and the dates of your baptism, and if uh, if 
that's you, we'd ask you to stand if you're not already standing. <laughs> and uh, uh, while we, we do that, and, and remain uh, standing uh, until uh, I'll tell you to quit standing. <laughs> <laughs> Tyrone Garner, April 7th, 2023. Brandy Spores, April 7th, 2023. Nicole Huggins, April 9th, 2023. Jeffrey Campbell, May 14th, 2023. <laughs> Jessica Campbell, May 14th, 2023. Walker Beatty, May 16th, 2023. Jonathan Rocchio, June 3rd, 2023. Jesse Lumen, June 18th, 2023. Corey Sisk, July 6, 2023. Uh, Ashley Lippincott, July 15th, 2023. Austin Coley, July 18th, 2023. Christy Tittle, August 20th, 2023. Joshua Iman, August 30th, 2023. Alexis Johnson, September 3rd, 2023. Joshua Rogers, September 17th, 2023. DeAndre Ray, September 18th, 2023. Harold Canada, October 10th, 2023. Garrett Delbridge, October 17th, 2023. James Loudermilk, January 2nd, 2023. Jason Tillery, January 11th, 2024. Sarah Duarte, February 11th, 2024. Jacob Smith, March 3rd, 2024. Ryan Cornelius, March 20th, 2024. We want to pray for these new brothers and sisters let's pray our kind heavenly father we're grateful for new life that you give we're thankful that we can be taken from our old lives and translated into your kingdom in a new and abundant life we're thankful that you were resurrected and you give us hope of our resurrection and not only physically but spiritually we're thankful for each of these, and we pray that you'll be with them as they continue their new life, and pray that they will, um, that you'll bless them, and that they'll be a blessing not only to themselves but to others. Uh, be with them and bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated now. <laughs> I want to introduce. Uh, one of the ones we just, uh, one of the names we just read, and that's uh, Austin Coley, and uh, he's going to uh, share with us. And uh, he graduated. Austin graduated in Janu on January seventh, uh, two thousand twenty-four, and uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, his change. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, first of all, happy Easter. I'm glad to be back. I don't come here as often as I should, but trying to make a point of substituting 
I guess two weeks at Essential Bible Study and then two weeks at Table Talk. I came for my first time about a week or two ago and it was nice to get to know some of the new brothers and just experience the brotherhood here. So very excited about being here this morning. My name is Austin Coley. I'm a new Christian with a clean slate. I will start out by giving you a quick rundown of my life prior to his way and having God in my life. I'm 32 years old, born March 15th, 1992 at Huntsville Hospital. My mother Kim and father Tony were young, so I lived and was raised by my great grandparents, Tommy and Peggy Jackson. The household was loving, but strict that I was raised in. I tried to bend all the rules set for me to my will. Weakness was frowned on at our house. I believe my grandparents were attempting to ready me for the world to come as they saw it. I was also a very mean child filled with anger, hate, and rage. I got into football and wrestling at an early age and I helped and that helped direct the aggression in a structured, positive setting. I also excelled in school, but was also defiant to the rules. This routine continued until I started working. I got my first car, started smoking weed at the age of 15. I was always a rebel without a cause, but with my own wheels, girls and a little cash in my pocket and a new feeling of having my mind and mood altered I couldn't get enough of. I also found my hopes, dreams, priorities and ambitions sinking down the drain. I would sleep during school, barely show up to ball practice and spent my earnings on partying and drugs. I got my GED and learned to trade. I had children lost my children, and continued to progress deeper into my addiction. I eventually racked up enough charges where the judge was tired of seeing me and sent me to prison. I got out of prison not long, not long after and went to his way when I was 24 or 25. This, this was my first experience out of rehab. I wasn't willing to listen or follow simple rules laid out for me. This led to several attempts at various rehabs from 25 to 31. I would maintain and do so-so for a while, but still get messed up a few times a year and was caught in this vicious cycle of attempt and failure over and over for years. I knew something wasn't right and I needed some fine tuning. I came to the conclusion that I had to listen follow and obey the rules, so I decided to go back to his way. I re-entered the program April 18th, 2023, with the hopes of gaining a few tools to help with life and continuous sobriety, but ultimately to appease the courts to sway the ruling to be involved in my son's life. I listened and followed suggestions when I first got here, but it was still a little rough around the edges. A few months into the program, I started inquiring about baptism. I had the reoccurring thought to be baptized for years, but didn't want to be on the fence about it. I wanted to be all in before that step was made. Talking with some guys that have made this step and trusted peers, I felt like I was ready to make this life-changing and altering move. So on July 16th at Hump Creek, Creek in Hazel Green, where me and my son used to fish, my Christian mentor, and her name's Teresa and Abigail Wilson, submerged me and my sins and brought me up out of that water into a new world and a bright light. Slowly, with my faith and trust in the Lord, he began to thaw out my iced over heart. He took the hate and rage and replaced it with love, excuse me, and replaced it with love, joy, and gentleness, kindness, and goodness. 
But when I let go and remain faithful and trusting, he blesses me with a calming peace. I know it will work out as he intends. He also has blessed me with consideration of others now, where I'm not so selfish and self-centered. When I give up control to him, he gives me everything. I truly hope everyone will get a taste of this because I believe that they will want these feelings and his love to surround their and others' lives at all times. If he does this for me, he can definitely do it for you. I'm so grateful to finally know that he is for me, with me, and in me. Lastly, we are all blessed for this wonderful day in history that we celebrate and honor. The best gift I have ever received. Thank you, God, for you and your son's perfect example to the world and his blood shed on that cross for all of our sins to redeem us from this world and to be the salt and light until you call us home into your glorious, wonderful, eternal kingdom. Amen. Thank y'all. Love y'all. Father, we thank you for the time of fellowship that we've enjoyed and for the celebration that we've experienced. I pray that you will help us to continue to keep um, the resurrection firmly planted within our hearts. And Father, help it to be expressed each and every moment throughout our days. Father, we thank you for the food that we're about to enjoy and the fellowship that we can enjoy as, as you have brought us together um, as one family in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.